Hi, welcome back to the Progressive Primitivist, where we believe the only way to go forward in religion is to go back to the Bible. I'm your co-host, Jake Hysaw. You are watching one of a series of videos where we will be sharing audio recordings from the Question and Answer Open Forum at the Freed Hardman Lectureship moderated by Guy Ian Woods and Gus Nichols from 1967 to 1973. We felt that these recordings were a blessing to us and our ministry here at the Progressive Primitivist and felt the need to share them and make them easily accessible here on YouTube. Now, we would like to preface and say that we don't endorse every answer uh, given in these recordings, but we do feel that they're a blessing to the body of Christ as we all are just here to pursue truth. Now, be sure to leave a like on our video and comment if you uh, like our content and would like to see more videos like this. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, that way you can see every time that we post videos like this. But more importantly, be sure to share this with someone that you believe would benefit from a study like this. And now, here's the open forum. And this is undoubtedly the largest audience that I ever saw here at an open forum. Tremendous crowd indeed, and we are truly grateful for the marvelous interest that you are exhibiting. You will recognize that in the very nature of the case, the fact that a question is submitted means that it involves a problem, that there is something controversial or at least difficult about it. And I have not the least uh, feeling that I can always, on every matter, satisfy everybody. It wouldn't be, the question wouldn't be submitted if it were that easy. I'm somewhat in the position here on all of these matters of the fellow that uh, takes a mouthful of coffee that's too hot to handle, and whatever he does about it is wrong. <laughs> I'm reminded of, in that connection of an old gentleman who was somewhat rustic in character that was attending a dinner. It was uh, where other, many other distinguished people were present. The old gentleman took a big uh, mouthful of coffee and suddenly discovered when it was too late that it was too hot to handle. He gurgled, and by that time all eyes were on him, but he handled it beautifully. He looked around and grinned and said, Some fools would have swallowed that stuff. <laughs> so at least we'll try to do the best we can with him. Now here is a matter that comes over from yesterday, if God were displeased with Israel's determination to have an earthly king, explain how he could enter into the selection of them. And then another question, by what law of reason or logic would God allow David and others to change matters of worship and government and then accept them by regulating them and not allow us today to do the same? For example, polygamy, and mechanical instruments of music, the government, and so on. Well, it's a matter of simple historic fact that such he did. One cannot question the fact of it. Now, as to why the Lord did it, there may be uh, differences of opinion. In the first place, I might point out to you this, that obviously Christianity is a superior system of religion. While the Lord tolerated such then, he will not do so today. When man in times past persisted in a course, Sometimes the Lord allowed it. For example, you will remember that it is said, Matthew 19, beginning with verse 1, that because of the hardness of the people's hearts, Moses allowed divorce. But from the beginning it was not so. And so there is an example of the fact that for a time the Lord tolerated a situation which he did not favor and which under the Christian age he will not allow, that is, for every cause. The same thing was true of the change in government. Now, I mentioned that on yesterday as an example of uh, the fact that the Lord, under uh, the former dispensation, did tolerate instrumental music, though he never intended for the people to use it. The times of ignorance in the past God winked at, so affirmed Paul in his great speech in Athens in Acts 17, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Today, the Lord will uh, requires and demands a higher mode of worship and living than that characteristic of former times. And so that's the reason why that he uh, tolerated it and even regulated it after man persisted in it. 
but then removed it. Of course, instrumental music is sinful in Christian worship today. I have affirmed that many times in debate. How does God answer our prayers? There are many, many ways in which he answers prayer, but in no instance does he do so by the performance of a miracle. He does so in harmony with his natural laws. Sometimes he answers prayer by refusing the specific request. Paul is an excellent example of that fact. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. There's been a great deal of discussion through the years as to the identity of that thorn. I incline to the view that it was some sort of an inflammatory eye condition. I believe the evidence is cumulated to that end. But I'm quite sure that it's not what a good brother in all seriousness told me he was sure it was in a meeting I was conducting in a California city a while back. He said he knew Paul was a married man. He not only knew he was married, he knew his wife's name because he said he read where Paul tried to get rid of her three times, but the Lord said grace was sufficient for him. Now, I'm quite sure that that's not the correct explanation of it. Can one pray for faith? Well, not the faith of which we speak when we make mention of the faith which is a condition of salvation. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, it is a fact that the word faith under the figure of the synecdoche stands for the entire Christian system, sometimes involving manner of conduct. And it's right, of course, for us to pray that we will uh, be able to conform to the Lord's will and that we may be able, through the study of his word, to arrive at a thorough knowledge of our duty or as much so as we can. And in that sense, perhaps yes, but not in the sense, certainly not in the sense that the Lord will bestow upon us the acceptance of his word, which comes only by the belief of the testimony that is therein set out. I I cannot imagine anyone being a member of the body of Christ and thinking that it is possible for one to pray and that the Lord in, in lieu of or apart from the testimony of his word will give us faith. It comes by hearing his word. I want to get uh, several of these before you here so that um, you in turn then will have uh, several matters that you can comment on. Is it possible to know from the Bible that one is going to heaven? Can one be sure while in this life well, now that involves the question of the extent of um, knowledge and to what uh, relationship faith has to knowledge and so on. We can have it with all of the assurance that any reasonable human being needs. Paul said, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. He said in 2 Corinthians 5 and 1, we know that if the earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building, a house from God, not made with hands, eternal and in the heavens. So these are strong assurances. Actually, there are two different Greek words that are used for knowledge in the Bible, gnosis, which suggests ordinary knowledge, and epinosis, which suggests a, a superior type of knowledge. And so um, I wouldn't say that it's not possible uh, to know. Of course, uh, uh, it, it depends a lot on what you mean by the word know. Now, one other matter here, before I turn it uh, to you. What kind of brotherhood discipline should be against a church that is having denominational tendencies brought out in it? I know that, that there are those who say that you can't withdraw from a church, but you can withdraw from each individual member of a congregation that's teaching false doctrine, and when you get through, what have you done? <laughs> now, that seems to me uh, makes it very clear that it is possible to withdraw from an entire congregation. And anybody that's in a congregation that is supporting the teaching of false doctrine is responsible for the teaching of the false doctrine. He ought to get out of it. If he doesn't endorse it, then he ought to oppose it. There's no such thing as neutrality in the Lord's work. Compromise was born in the mind of the devil and it's been used as an instrument to, uh, to affect the work of the church from the very beginning. Now, in fields of expediency, where there are half a dozen ways to do a thing, yes, any one of which is, all of which are right and, and any one of which we might accept, but where there may be some reason why one is better. But when it comes to fundamental principles, there's no such thing as compromise. We ought never to yield a point on any matter. Nobody appreciates a compromiser. 
I often think of the fellow back during the, the Civil War that wasn't mad at anybody, and he, he didn't want to shoot anybody, and especially he didn't want to get shot. So he thought him up a scheme that would protect him. He thought from both sides. He got him a Union coat and a pair of Confederate pants. <laughs> but they found him dead on the battlefield, and he had a Union bullet through the Confederate pants and a Confederate bullet through the Union coat. <laughs> Now, <clears throat> I have here, by, ver by the very nature of the case, submitted several matters, and I got a lot more of them here, but I think it's fair to tell you this. Number one, I try to select the questions that seemed of general interest, and secondly, somewhat in the order in which they were presented to me. It's not quite fair for someone to give me a question yesterday uh, that, uh, uh, in response to my urgent request that I needed questions then, and then wait until I get on the platform and hand me one here when I've already got a lot. I'm glad to have them all, but it does seem fair to take them somewhat in that order, and I trust that you'll bear with me in that respect. Now then, who has something to say on what I have said thus far? Well, maybe we haven't yet got to something sufficiently controversial. Does anybody have an observation or anything you want to say additionally, all right? Well, I feel that um, there are many, many wonderful benefits in prayer. And I certainly feel that God will answer prayer and that it's right, in fact, that it's a sin for us not to pray. First Samuel chapter 12, verse 23, God forbid that I should sin against Jehovah in not praying for you. I certainly don't subscribe to the view that it's ineffective to pray. Paul said in the first chapter of Philippians that I know that this shall turn out to my salvation through your prayer. Paul expected in some way or other his release to be conditioned on that. James said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now it's true that much is a comparative term. I do not know how much much is, but it's more than a little. And since, <laughs> and since the Bible says that prayer avails much, and since much is more than a little, it's right for me to affirm that prayer avails more than a little. And so to deny it is itself a denial of the affirmation of the text. Why, of course it avails to pray. The question is not, I think, with the average discussion along this line, does God answer prayer? But then what are the means that he uses in the answer to prayer? Now to know all about that would involve, of course, having the mind of God. That same point needs to be very carefully considered in the study of the Holy Spirit that is now today current. And that is to be able to distinguish between what the Spirit does for us and what the Spirit does to us. Some rather are confusing those two things, and that's basically responsible for the difficulties that are now uh, existing among us on it. But more about that as we have opportunity. Anything further on that matter? If I do not see someone's hand, please help me. Is there a difference between Soul and spirit, if so, would you please comment on it? There is a definite difference in some passages. The word spirit is a spe specific term. The word soul is a generic term. You cannot answer the question, what is the soul, by a brief statement, because it's used in four different senses in the Bible. It's used in the sense of the full person that was added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. It's used in the sense of the animal life, Psalm 78, 50, God spared not their souls from death. It's used in the sense of the intellectual nature. It's in the Greek text in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And it's used synonymously with the Spirit. Thou wilt not leave my soul unto Hades, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. So the word soul is a generic term. And when you ask, what does it mean? You have to see the passage, the context in which it occurs in order to be able to explain it with any degree of satisfaction. 
Should people go forward for any reason other than to be baptized, to confess public sin, and be restored to Christ, or to affiliate themselves uh, with the congregation? Should one go forward just to clear his conscience, or should this be done in, in his private prayers? Well, I think it should be done in his private prayers. I hold to the view that a sin ought to be confessed with the same degree of publicity that characterized the commission of the sin. A sin known only to God, confessed only to God. A sin known only to a few, confessed only to a few. A sin that's public in nature, confessed before the church. I think that's a safe and sound rule. And I do not hold that just because someone is conscious of the fact that he has um, um, failed to measure up to the standard, and who is it of us that hasn't failed? On that basis, then there should be a response on the part of us all at every service. I'm certain that the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing those who are trying to do right, and that there is no need for such confession. I'm aware of the fact that sometimes appeals are made that embrace everybody with reference to, with, without regard to what their situation is, and sometimes they garner some peculiar situations. As, for example, in one of the campaigns a while back, a little nine-year-old girl got uh, caught in the uh, group that was coming down the aisle, and someone escorted her to a seat, and one of the workers approached her and said, uh, what, uh, what were your wishes? She said, I want to go to the bathroom. So it seems to me like that we need to make it clear why they should come, come forward. Please comment on 1 Corinthians 10, 13 with reference to God's providence. How does God provide or make the way of escape? God is faithful who will not suffer one to be tempted above that which he is able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that he may be able to bear it. Well, I see no difficulty whatsoever there connected with how God does it. He does it by providing us with the incentive, the motive, not only that, but the instruction on how to do it. David said in Psalms 119 and verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Why, certainly the Lord provides the way. He shows us the reason for it. He establishes the incentive and, and gives us the ground upon which we ought to resist the temptation. I see nothing there to indicate that there should be some mysterious leading or influence in our hearts that would prompt us to do it that's not through the teaching of his word. Now, it's very true that people do not take that way of escape, but then they just do not avail themselves of the instruction that the word provides. Our Lord is the best example that we could give in his resistance of Satan on the mount. He said it is written, and in that fashion it was successful. Anybody a word on that? or on any matter along this line. All right, sir? Stand, stand up, please. Well, <laughs> that's one of those uh, questions that involves a great amount of difficulty. I, I frankly do not know how or in all the ways in which the Lord throws protection around his people. I know that the Bible says that there are ministering spirits sent forth uh, to minister to them that are heirs of salvation. But ministering spirits are simply servants, and uh, in the first place, uh, one would first have to prove that that was, that is, to support the view of some uh, supernatural guidance or help that such involve the angels. Uh, ministering spirits are simply servants, and servants to those who are heirs of salvation. And so I, I'm unable to tell you uh, what it means because I don't think any of us other than just give an opinion of it, and that's all that I could do is just to say that in some way or other the Lord provides help for his people. But that's affirmed repeatedly in the Bible. But we do know that no one is an heir of salvation that doesn't hear the gospel. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And whatever these helps or aids are, they do not supplant God's approved method of salvation. Uh, yes, indeed, but not to tell him what to do to be saved. Uh, that's a sermon that we've all preached repeatedly, and a good one, and ought to be preached more. 
to show that the Lord uses human instrumentality in the presentation of the gospel. Now then, someone might ask, well, what about the guardian angel? I frankly confess that just as all others who've studied it, that I don't know all that's involved in that, I do remember a splendid comment from Brother David Lipscomb when he said that whatever it is, it doesn't mean that a person doesn't have to adhere to God's will in order to be saved. We know that from other teaching in the Bible. I, I feel that that's a subject on which uh, you would like a little more uh, help, and so uh, who will volunteer to make a brief statement about that? <laughs> now, I, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to be facetious. I actually would like to have a comment or two from any of you brethren that would, uh, that would uh, comment on it. I, d I know of nobody on earth that I think would know more about any matter connected with the Bible than Brother Gus Nichols. Brother Gus, do you have a word on it for us? <laughs> Friends, could you imagine Brother Nichols not having anything to say? <laughs> Well, that just shows his honesty and his goodness. That just shows that, that when we don't know what to say, the best thing to do is just say we don't. Here a while back, a young fellow said, Brother Woods, why do you tell people when they ask you what the Battle of Armageddon is? I said, I tell them I don't know, because I don't, and they'll soon find out when I start trying to explain it. <laughs> so I just well tell them to begin with. There are some things that we just can't know. And so, again... We appreciate Brother Nichols' statement all along that line. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And uh, so that's, uh, that's the way we feel about it. But does anyone have uh, anything further on any point along this line? All right. Now, in that case, uh, I, I'm inclined to think that the congregation would have known, that is, the elders would have known, the treasurer would have known. Uh, I think that, the, uh, that there would be those in a congregation that would know whether a person was giving properly or not, although sometimes it's possible to hide it. I want to tell you about a place where I was in a meeting a while back, a congregation of about 400 members. For more than seven years, now that's not in this section of country, but for more than seven years, Every large day morning, there has been a blank check folded just like that without anything on it dropped in the contribution basket every Sunday for the last seven years. Well, of course, the curiosity of the brethren kills them. <laughs> but then there isn't any way that they can find out until that person gets sick and then it'll stick out like a sore thumb. Stand up. Stand up. Are you saying that the practice or is it the only accommodation? What practice, sir? The practice of the congregation to not want to send their sin to be confessed. Discouraging people to confess their sin? If there were 190 people here or 1,900 people that had committed sin known to others, uh, then it should have been confessed. That's what we said. Well, there's no other way to confess a sin to the public except do it publicly. No, we're not discouraging the confession of sin in the category that we described a few moments ago. But what I was suggesting was that Many times, people are induced who are just simply aware of their weakness, and usually it's the best people in the congregation. Well, of that class of people, the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing if they're living according to the 
a New Testament as best they can. We all live imperfect lives. And if we had to live a perfect life, none of us would ever be saved. Now, sometimes people get the idea that you have to in order to get to heaven, in which case they disregard the, prov the provision of the Lord. I was in a meeting in a Louisiana town a while back, and a brother said to me that he was sure that there'd be fewer people saved next time than were saved from the flood in the ark. Well, that about eliminates us all. There being on that occasion only eight souls delivered, physically delivered, and he didn't tell me who the other seven are. <laughs> I'm quite sure he thought he was in that crowd. All right. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I, I think that you point out a real inconsistency in our practice along that line. I really do. All right, sir. <laughs> only, if it is a, only if it is known to the congregation. The point I'm making is this, that sins should be confessed as publicly as they were committed. What is the point in a person confessing a sin to the congregation that only God knows about? I've known of instances where real harm was done to the cause of Christ by that, by bringing reproach upon the cause of Christ, by bringing out in the public a matter that would never have been known except to the Lord and should have been corrected that way. Of course, once a matter is known, we're taught to pray one, we confess our faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The reason for that is that we can't pray for people unless we know that they've repented. Uh, if a brother sins, we are rebuke him. If he repent, we are to forgive him. And unless there's evidence of repentance, you can't forgive. But we are taught to forgive. Now, how can you forgive if they haven't repented? And if they don't make that known, how can you know that they've repented? So that's the reason why that a public confession is required. But where it's not a matter of our forgiveness, but simply God's forgiveness, and we have nothing against them to forgive, then it should, it's a matter which should be uh, dealt with with God. Indeed so. Indeed so, to let the people round about know that he has uh, seen the error of his way and wants to do something about it. All right. Well, there again is the resorting to um, phraseology that not only is not known to the Scriptures, but it conveys an idea in connection with uh, the way in which it's used that is not right. I deplore, brethren, these, the, the disposition for us to change our phraseology. Of course, the idea is to make it fit our practice. But in times past, we've talked about speaking where the Bible speaks and being silent where it's silent, and doing Bible things in Bible ways, and calling Bible things by Bible names. And I know of no better rule to go by. And I'm reading today from some of our brethren phraseology that I see first or saw first in denominational publications some years ago, beginning to pick up some of that material, some of the brethren are, and it indicates that they're allowing themselves to be influenced more by denominational writers than they are by the literature of our brethren. And in that connection, I want to tell you this, and uh, uh, certainly the author of it doesn't know that I intend to say anything about it, but I want to tell you that in my opinion, one of the most significant books to appear in the last 10 years, and it ought to be read by every member of the church, it was written by Ira Rice, and the title of it is Acts at the Root. Amen. That is a marvelous book. In fact, it is actually what its title suggests. And he's saying things there that ought to be said and that everybody ought to know about. And if we don't recognize it and do something about it, the cause we love will not exist as we know it in the next generation. So I, I, I want to uh, add my word of comment along that line. Anybody now, anything thus far?
I'm seeing in the libraries of our preachers a magazine called Christianity Today. I see it in almost half of the preachers' libraries where I go. And brethren, I'm almost sure where this language of Ashdod is coming from among the greater part of our brothers is from that magazine. And when we get to the point that we will spend more of our time and money devouring such magazines as Christianity Today, Commonweal, Christianity in Crisis, and those magazines, rather than the Gospel Advocate and the Firm Foundation, and those that have borne the battle, the brunt of that battle in the heat of the day, in that day, brethren, we are on our way to an apostasy. And we're on our way now. That's exactly right. I, I, and I'm grieved and alarmed and disturbed by it. But I've been warning of that for the last several years. Brother Nichols wanted to say something. We want to restrain ourselves, not go to too great extremes now, such as that education is always dangerous. Or something. Amen. Well, that's very... That's very true. But unfortunately, many of our brethren today think that education is only accreditation. They have forgotten, some of them, that true education is the acquisition of truth involving varied facts. To many people today, that is not education. In fact, many of our brethren today are worshiping at the shrine of the doctorate. And that's the reason why that in some areas, theme papers will be accepted only when the documentation is denominational in nature. Now that I am against. All right. Anything by anybody else? Yes. I'd like to make an observation or a statement. Uh, and get you to comment on back on this public confession situation. That I ran into this situation some time ago. Drawing a parallel line up to this brother in the church. Uh, going to the congregation, uh, began to drink. And uh, his wife let it be known. And this person was talked to about it and prayed with about it. And by much uh, uh, counseling with him, he gave it up. He called it his wife and made him uh, much better by their business. Became a better husband, a better father, and uh, more faithful <coughs> in attending the services. But some time has passed, uh, many, many months, and he was someone asked the service, and somebody makes the statement for him, which I think would be entirely acceptable. All right? Well, I would never discourage anybody from doing anything that is, does not involve wrongdoing when it obviously is a desire on their part to do right. But I would tell them that it was not necessary because in the first place, when the brethren, as was pointed out a while ago, when prayers are offered, it's offered for the weak and for the discouraged and, and for the uh, uh, poor and so on, which embraces all of that. I'm afraid that we've created the a sort of a confessional in which people feel that they cannot enjoy forgiveness unless they make some sort of a formal acknowledgement. That has, that smacks a little bit of the confessional. And I'm not so sure, but what there is uh, some uh, similarity there. Now, I understand I'm not likening the responses that are made in meetings. When a man makes us an appeal to somebody. There may be somebody back there that he's trying his best to get to come forward, and ought to. And the preacher 
exhaust his resources. All of us have done that in our appeal to this man, publicly, of course. And when we give the invitation, instead of him coming forward, a half a dozen others that were touched by the appeal come. Well, we certainly wouldn't discourage them. But we're not discussing this afternoon whether or not such is wrong. I don't think it's wrong. I'm just pointing out that it's not necessary to their salvation. That's the point we're making. In Acts 8 and 24, Simon asked Peter to pray for him. Yes. And it's right to ask one person yes. to pray for us. Would it be wrong to ask two or a whole congregation? It would be right to ask the entire congregation, of course. In fact, I... Th- Yes, yes, that, that's, he wouldn't have to wait until the Lord's Day in order to make his conviction. All right, Brother Nichols, come right on. <laughs> First of all, I would like to refer to an example. Uh, we had Brother Bradfield with us. Last Lord's Day was a week ago. And 37 people responded to the invitation that day. Uh, there came uh, one young lady forward to be baptized at the morning service, a 16-year-old young lady of a denominational family, and she was baptized that morning. Then in the afternoon, when he spoke, especially for the benefit of young people, but any others who might be interested, a number of others came forward. Uh, making uh, ten, uh, I believe, in the afternoon to be baptized and the others to be, you know, they just came asking for prayer or confessing their sins. And then at the night service, after Brother Bradfield left, two other young people came, I'm sure, because of the inspiration of the example they had seen and they had had further time to consider the matter and think it over. And uh, I baptized them that night, making 13 baptized, and I believe 24 had uh, come confessing their wrongs. Now, out of those who came to confess their sins, I personally know them, know that nearly every one of them should have come. And one of them had not been taking the Lord's Supper in some three or four months now one of our uh, above middle-aged men. And I know many others who came, should have come, and we've been trying to get them to repent and to repent of their lukewarmness. Some of them just guilty of downright no countness, if you please, in the church. (laughs) And Paul said when they were lukewarm there, rather John in Revelation 3.14, that God would spew them out, and I know a person that's about to be spewed out ought to repent, and he ought to make a confession of it, and if other people know that he's in that condition, he ought to do something about it. And he ought to let them know that he has done something about it if he makes a decision to turn from his lukewarmness. And in verse 19 he said, As many as I love, I rebuke and chase and be zealous therefore and repent. And when members of the church repent of publicly known lukewarmness and indifference and no countness in the church, if you please, why they ought to let the church know that they've done that. Now, this past Sunday night, one young man who was in that group who confessed uh, his sins just said he had not been living as he should. That's what he wrote on the card that we gave him. I've not been living as I should as a member of the church, and I want to live right, I want the prayers of the church. Now, this past Sunday night, that young man told me privately that he had decided to preach the gospel. And so, out of Brother Bradfield's work, there came a great revival in the church, because it revives the church for people to obey the gospel, and actually to see people under the power of God's word. That puts other people to thinking about it and gets them con- to consider the importance of it. When everybody is being vaccinated for something, 
or of having their lungs tested to see if they have TB. It helps me to think about it and go be examined also, whether I'm sick or well. But uh, that's not wrong. Any good influence that'll help people to do right is not a bad influence and is not to be disdained. And uh, there are people who would preach the gospel in the church of the Lord if they had fully cut loose from the world and from lukewarmness and really and truly, privately, to God and to the church, if need be, dedicate themselves to God in the sense that we mean that to use that word. Paul, I think, meant it when he said, present your body as a living sacrifice. And they had already obeyed the gospel. This is to the Roman brethren. They had done been baptized into Christ. Present your body as a living sacrifice. Offer yourself fully and completely to God. And in Romans 12, 1 and 2, and then in 2 Corinthians 8, and the secret of the success of these Macedonian churches who gave out of deep poverty, he said, first, they gave themselves to God. Now, that had no reference back to their conversion, but it's something they did as members of the church. First, they gave themselves to God and to us by the will of God. And when people cease to belong wholly and altogether to God, they need to come back and present themselves unto God. And if it's uh, publicly known that they have not been wholly and completely dedicated, consecrated, presented to God, or whatever you want to call it, then they ought to make it known that they mean to be thus consecrated in the future. Thank you, Brother. Nichols. Brother Nichols is good to have on the forum. He always has something good to say when we need help along that line. I'm certainly not uh, toward him like the uh, little boy was about his uh, mother. When he went to his father about some matter and wanted some information, his dad is busy, and he said, go ask your mama. He said, I don't want to know that much about it. We do want to know, we do want, we do want to know all that Brother Nichols has, has to say because he always has something good to say. And I want to point out now very carefully that uh, as he has described the activities there, that was a legitimate, in my opinion, type of confession. It ought to be, and I rejoice in the great ability of men like Brother Bradfield, Brother Paul Murphy back here who is second to none in that respect, and uh, many other brethren among us today who do have great ability in inducing people to want to do right. And that's really what it amounts to. And I would never discourage anybody. The point I was making was that the, the extent of publicity that ought to be attached to a confession. And I think we all would agree along that line. Uh, all right, sir. Brother Wood, uh, I'm constrained to uh, say this. First, to subscribe to not consent in private thinking. There is a school of thought today that a person is just as guilty for thinking a thing as saying it. We had in our uh, area a case where public confession was not made from a person who was an insider. Now, the person went off and uh, subscribed and practiced with a denomination, a Baptist church, went from the Church of Christ in a capacity of leadership, and then came back and from the back seat finally moved up and assumed the oversight of the congregation. And this went on for several years. The preaching evidently fell on deaf ears until finally he was persuaded, and when he made his confession, it sounded so feeble that uh, my judgment is that there was insincerity in his confession. He said, one brother told me I ought to do this. And so there's <coughs> insliding or a front sliding, and uh, we shouldn't uh, encourage all confessions, but certainly those that need to be Yes, with that we would all agree. Now we have only two or three more minutes that I'm going to take quickly here to run through several of these. Uh, <clears throat> where is the verse or verses that teach us that Christ lived on earth three and a half years? Well, uh, it'd be more nearly 
uh, 33 and a half years is the more accurate deal, not three and a half. As a, ma as a matter of fact, uh, we learn it from the chronology of the uh, events that are there recorded. Is it right to use Isaiah 28 and 9 to condemn the doctrine of infant baptism? Is this the proper use of this passage? Not directly. I would, if I were going to condemn infant uh, baptism, I'd go to the New Testament to do it. I was baptized some 25 years ago, been active member since I was truly converted, and understood clearly baptism was a command, but I don't know whether it was for remission of sins or not at that time. Is my baptism valid? I believe that it is. He understood it was a command, a duty of his to, to perform. All of us have learned things with reference to our duty, and we will as long as we live. I wouldn't worry one moment about it were I you. Brother Woods, in the light of 1 Corinthians 16, 2, would it be right for a Christian to write a check once a month for his contribution since that's the way he's paid? All right. Who wants to speak first on that? <laughs> <laughs> now, that's a, that's a question that's not easy to answer. There's not anything that I know of that would give us direct light on it. Personally, my personal feeling is, and yet I don't know exactly how I'd go about sustaining it, just from the standpoint of expediency, it would be better to break it up into four Lord's Day contributions, or five when there are five Sundays. Otherwise, what about the fellow that's just paid once a year? Or what about the fellow that just inherits a lot of money? Can he then just give, uh, re uh, give the proper portion of that, and then from then on never drop a dime in? He'd set a bad example before the congregation, wouldn't he? Here's a fellow say that's a millionaire, and when the basket's passed in front of him, he never contributes. He did it back yonder some time before. Well, that money would be worth just as much to the Lord, but I believe it would be worth more to him if he would contribute uh, Lord's Day by Lord's Day. Does the New Testament condemn social drinking, or do we have to condemn it on principles alone? I am convinced that it condemns it in both ways, that the Bible teaches that it's sinful. I believe it is sinful to drink a single drop of the stuff. And I, I deplore the fact that we are now seeing further liberality in that re respect. And now uh, I know that some of them will make statements and then they crawfish on them. They come back and say they didn't say it. But then uh, <clears throat> some brethren today are advocating the view that we ought not to condemn the man that drinks moderately. Now that's, that's wrong. Rev uh, all right. Well, you've got one minute, Brother Harper. I'll have to get right in this thing. I've got laryngitis, but all that drinking. I want you to think about this argument. They suggest that Christ, the apostles, and all the early Christians drank moderately. Now the suggestion is that in writing and teaching, and it's not just one man, this, this is a lot of them, that in doing that, we're suggesting that we exercise our freedom and liberty, Christian liberty, not because of a command, but because up here not to do it is better than doing it down here. And I want you to see what that did. That's put Christ, the apostles, the early Christians, down here on the low plane. And these fellows have found that by exercising our Christian liberty and not doing it, we're having a better example up here. You know what that does? That takes Christ off the cross. For it makes him guilty of living a lower life. And his example is not what it ought to be. And I just can't believe that. What they'll have to do is to equate their social moderate drinking out here on the better way of Christian living. They have to equate the one the other. But they've got Christ down here. They found out a better way to live, and they're advocating, now you live up here because you have liberty not to drink, and this is a better example. And they put Christ down here. Now you think that over. Thank you, Brother Harper, and those are very fine thoughts. Now tomorrow, if you want to discuss that in detail, we'll be glad to do so. Brother Woodson. Again, thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, if you like our content, if you want to see more videos like this, make sure you leave a thumbs up on our video and you comment. 
uh, what you thought in the comment section. But also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you can see uh, our content and whenever we post content. And make sure you follow us on our social medias in the description below. Uh, thank you again. See you next time.